Hello and good evening. Thank you so much for spending your time with us this Thursday evening. My name is Carol Barrow. I'm a public relations specialist and founder of SanFranciscoWriter.com. Um, on Bridging the Cultural Divide, where we'll be talking to some prominent leaders from a variety of industries about how to promote deeper cultural awareness, gender harmony, and generate some inspiration between people with different backgrounds. Our goal today is that you'll come away with a new idea, a new perspective, um, maybe even a new strategy about how to talk to friends, relatives, colleagues, about how we can kind of move forward from understanding across what feels like a, a widening rift in, in cultural divide in our country. So here's the format. I'm just going to briefly introduce each of our panelists and um, give a tiny bit of background about their organizations that they represent. And then I will let them jump in and uh, share a little bit more about themselves. And then we will have some questions. So this evening, I'm joined by Sophie Alcorn, founder of Alcorn Immigration Law in Silicon Valley, which is the 2019 Global Law Experts Awards Law Firm of the Year in California for Entrepreneur Immigration Services. She's a contributor for TechCrunch's weekly Dear Sophie Immigration column and a host of the podcast, Immigration Law for Tech Startups. Welcome, Sophie. Hi. Thank you. We also, to be here. Okay, great to have you. We also have Rhonda Fami, the founder of Makeup America, a new Made in America beauty brand. She was inspired to launch the company after a 30 year career in law and politics in Washington, D.C., as an internationally recognized expert in global government affairs, energy policy, and national security. Welcome. Great, great to be with you and all your viewers tonight. Wonderful. Uh, next, we have Abby Parsons III, Managing Partner Yardstick Management, which is the nation's leading black-owned management consulting firm, supporting organizational strategy as well as diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging at the world's most recognizable companies. Hi, Abby. Hi, good to be here. Glad to have you. Um, we also have Sid Wilson, President and CEO of the Hispanic Association on Corporate Responsibility. Uh, he's been President and CEO since July 2014. He has more than 20 years of corporate finance and Wall Street equity research experience, works closely with corporate board members, Hispanic organizations, and corporate partners around the country to increase the representation of Hispanic at all levels of corporate America. He also directs programs and initiatives aimed at encouraging Fortune 500 companies to include Hispanics in the area of employment, procurement, philanthropy, and governance. Hello, Sid. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Good to be here. Awesome to have you. And last but not least, we have Sanjeev Tethi, President, Minneapolis College of Art and Design, with two decades of experience as an artist and cultural academic leader. For the past three years, Stephanie has served as the first director of the Corcoran School of the Arts and Design at George Washington University, where he oversaw the reestablishment of the historic art and design college as it integrated with the university. Hello. <laughs> We're glad you're here. And just for our, our audience who's tuned in, Sanjeev um, is with us. Uh, we have some audio for Sanjeet, and we may even have some video at a later time, but we'll play it by ear. So thank you all for joining me. Um, and I think this time in our country, is, is this is such a timely issue. Um, and I think I just wanted to start with some general questions, and then we can drill down into some more specifics. Uh, and all of you are welcome to answer these more general questions, which are like, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of 
very tumultuous times and dark events that have happened in the past year, obviously. But um, what are some areas of optimism that you can see as we take all the equal justice hashtags and public support and try to translate that into real world results? And anyone who would like to jump in on that, just feel free and start there. Well, I can start. I'm an immigration lawyer in California, and I'm really excited about the myriad immigration laws that are uh, coming forth to support diversity and equality and um, provide people with access to lead better lives and have security for themselves and their families and to be able to get jobs. And um, that really brings in a lot of um, you know, a lot of different groups of people from all around the world and different cultural backgrounds. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, like today, I'm really excited that the House passed a version of the DREAM Act. So this is this is wonderful news that would support the strengthening of our communities in the United States. And um, I just love the way you phrased the question. I think the more we can focus on um, the positive of what we want to create and the people coming together. I think that sets the seeds for um, what we want to grow and uh, and nurture. Yeah, I think in your capacity as an immigration attorney, you're, you're really in the trenches when it comes to, you know, kind of uh, heralding in some change and seeing the evolution of immigration laws from administration to administration through time. Um, and, Abby, I know you being in dark stick management at the home, um, I think one of, one of the really great things and positive things that has come out of, you know, all that, the past year has been that we have seen a lot more dedication to diversity at the sea level and um, in leadership positions. Is that something that you would say is a takeaway from, from this kind of progression that we've had? Yes, I, what what I see is at the at the C suite and board director level, I think that organizations are beginning to realize that it is an access gap versus a capabilities gap, mm. and, and um, the opportunities are truly opening up for uh, people from from historically uh, underrepresented backgrounds and historically disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, mm. So it's it's critical in order in order for us to be successful. I mean, as a as a nation, it's you know in twenty I think in twenty fifty. We're going to be a majority minority country and we, we have to write the ship now. Um, otherwise, our organizations won't be able to compete on a global scale. Right. Right. Is that something that you would corroborate in your capacity, Sid, just being um, at the helm of a, a corporate oriented organization that has um, has at its core the credo of sort of creating opportunities for um people of color, Hispanic people in the corporate world? Have you seen a shift? So the answer is very slow shift. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's still a crawl at the C-suite level and at the board director level. Mm -hmm. Certainly, um, you know, we're happy to see uh, corporate America recognizing that we do need to bridge this cultural divide because uh, what's happened uh, in the last uh, couple of months of uh, these uh, this, this rise in hate against Asian Americans? What happened with uh, George Floyd and Arbor Breonna Taylor? Um, what uh, happened um, uh, prior to that in the uh, in El Paso, Texas, Walmart that targeted Mexican Americans? Yeah. When you look at what happened at the uh, at the tree of uh, at the synagogue in Pittsburgh. Uh, specifically targeting uh, uh, Jewish Americans, it's it's clear that that corporate America is understanding more that in the absence of leadership in government, that corporate America must take leadership in terms of uh, being a part of the solution to bridge that cultural divide, um, because it's the the the, the, the current. Uh, um, situation that's impacting people of color or underrepresented communities uh, is one that even even as our population grows, 
Um, and in many states, we are already the majority minority. Um, mm -hmm. That still doesn't translate to leadership leadership diversity. And, and so those are some things that we will uh, continue to advocate, not just in terms of what we're doing to the Hispanic inclusion, but with many of our diversity partners to make sure that there is diversity at the top. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and it's good to hear you tackle it from that corporate level. If we don't have the representation necessarily that we want in government, we can approach it from a corporate angle as well. And I know that that Rhonda, Rhonda, I'm sorry, um, that's something that you've also been approaching just because you have that background in government and now you've transitioned to create your company. As you've made that transition, like how do you see uh, the difference in, and how to affect change, you know, from a, from a policy standpoint versus a corporate and maybe enterprise standpoint? Sure. So I think the first problem or the first um uh, recognition when you have a problem is to admit you have a problem, right? Mm -hmm. And we have a problem in America and it's okay to talk about it because when you talk about it, then you can find solutions for it. So whether it's, you know, uh, civil rights for the African American community or Hispanic community or Asian American community, it's so reminiscent to what happened to the Arab American and Muslim American community after 9-11. I mean, I see what's happening and it happens to communities that make up this rich tapestry that we call America. And I think part of step one is to talk about it. Admit you have a problem, mm -hmm. start talking about it, and then find solutions. And so whether it's in my policy background or my entrepreneur, you know, corporate background, what I strive to do, particularly in the company that I founded, Make Up America, is I wanted to reflect the American spirit. And the question mm -hmm. becomes, what is the American spirit? What does America mean to you, right? It's all up in your head. America is what you make it out to be. It's a collective mm -hmm. notion of your experiences, which in America, we are mixed races and cultures and people, and um, we are not uh, monolithic by any means here, but there is one thing that binds us together. It's this belief in the American dream and the American mm -hmm. spirit, which consists of resiliency and finding solutions for things. Um, when we break, when we bend, you know, mm -hmm. where are those solutions? And we're going through that right now and that's okay. That's part of the process. Yeah, definitely being tested right now from, from every conceivable angle. But you're right, the American dream is kind of that thread that we're holding on to and mm -hmm. um, maybe adapting and changing, but hopefully it's becoming a dream that is attainable for more people uh, from more diverse backgrounds and different cultures. Right. Uh, yeah. And Sanjeev, just speaking to that, I think from an academic or academia standpoint and also being in the arts, is that something that you've seen? I know academia has previously had a reputation for not being as inclusive as it could be but perhaps even just there's been some movement in the last year to be more inclusive and make sure that there are um, areas of study that reflect a little bit more of a complete picture of what it means to be American, whether that's in the arts or um, social studies or various other fields of study. Is that something that you've seen evolving? Yeah, you know, and if if I could, I mean, I'm happy to speak also just kind of more more broadly because I actually really I think both what what Sid said and and um, uh, and what Rhonda said also really uh, kind of resonate with me, which is I think there's the um, when you certainly look at high school graduation rates and looking at the vastly changing demographics of what um, what you see as being a typical student, the notion of a what's a normal student um, used to be the kind of you know. Um, you know, kind of Ward Cleaver, you know, kind of white, kind of middle class, uh, you know, kind of uh, stereotype. Uh, and that's vastly changing. Uh, and that's changing, I think, for the better. Uh, I think cultural complexity is good. I think the idea of um, uh, what, uh, and I think what we're kind of doing is asking what's what's really American genius look like? You know, what are the kind of qualities that you see in this idea of American genius, whether that's 
um, innovators, uh, innovators, culture makers, um, um, uh, scientists, researchers. Oftentimes, all of these are involved with academia. But more broadly, I think the question is, how are we more intentional uh, with these communities about leadership? Um, you know, um, and so it's one thing to get whether it's a degree. It's one thing to go ahead and get um, positions in industry. It's another thing to start to cultivate a more dynamic articulation of what leadership is. So, uh, like uh, like uh, many of my colleagues here in this panel, um, uh, being a person of color, it starts to feel like you're in this category of the accidental person of color leader, right? In the sense that it is you kind of defied the odds, and and I guess I kind of think. The, the, the real task at hand uh, and whether that occurs from a pedagogical standpoint or that occurs from an industry standpoint or occurs from a kind of co-mentorship standpoint is how are we more intentional about uh, educating leaders uh, and cultivating leaders um, and, and doing enough to support uh, leaders in particular leaders um, that I think bring about uh, a more contoured version of what American genius really is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that that uh, is something that has had to evolve because, um, and I think going back to Abby, you may have seen this in hiring practices. I've noticed that there has been a movement, and Sophie, I know that this is an area that you speak to as well, is that there has been more of an inclusive sort of stance when it comes to hiring for positions. So mm-hmm. even the language is changing in a lot of the um, job listings to say, You know, this is the experience that we would like to see. However, we are trying to broaden that umbrella and embrace various candidates from various backgrounds. So do feel free to step up and throw your hat into the ring, Um, even though you may not look like a perfect cookie cutter cutter, um, version of what would normally fit the position. Um, Is that something that you've seen, um, Abby and maybe Sophie and maybe even Sid, um, as you see candidates uh, for higher positions in the workforce, for C-suite, for technical positions, that uh, there's just a little bit more of a broader scope when it comes to recruiting. Yeah, so we we actually directly work with a number of the, a number of the world's leading organizations on being really intentional about this and mm-hmm. transforming their job descriptions. Um, mm-hmm. So we're focused on helping organizations think about. And this is from, you know, mid-level all the way to the C-suite. As we think about what we're looking for, we are helping companies think through how to make sure that there's as inclusive, uh, the descriptions are inclusive as possible. So removing gendered language, removing pronouns when when, when they're really unnecessary, uh, removing years of experience or industry uh, requirements. We're helping organizations to think through what does it take to be successful in the role versus what did the last five, five white males who had the role do in their prior career to get those opportunities. So when we think about years of experience, these all of the, the, the traditional requirements in these job descriptions are essentially proxies for success. Um, but they're not actually measuring the ability to be successful in the role. Uh, so if you've got seven years of experience, there's a guesstimate you'll, you'll, you'll have mastered this. But now we're focused on being more intentional about what mastery looks like. And how can you specifically identify the skill sets necessary to be successful versus having descriptions and recruiting candidates uh, based on proxies for what you think would be uh, successful. So that way you can you can try to start mitigating bias. I mean, humans, humans are human. We all have biases. However, if we can mitigate bias as much as possible, um, it will allow for us to really, truly diversify the top of the funnel for candidates. That, that makes sense, and I think that's something that perhaps all of us have seen um, over the past year, just even the language changing, just to, to be a, more inclusive overall and provide a little bit more opportunity um, and not have every candidate be a direct reflection of the interviewer, I think, sure. <laughs> is really the goal. Um but maybe I could turn to you, Sophie, just in that, I mean, you're really, you really have your finger on the pulse when it comes to um, the changing face of immigration employment and what that means. I mean, coming from the Bay Area, of course.
learning in that realm. Yeah. Thank you. Well, first of all, I love um, this focus on objective criteria and clearing out the biases. That's wonderful and so refreshing. And I, and I see the need for that. And I started a nonprofit over the last year to support international students to get jobs in the United States. And, you know, we have laws that prevent discrimination based on national origin, but whether a company is willing to go the extra step and support somebody for an H-1B visa or other type of immigration sponsorship is another question. And there's lots of um, people who want to be new Americans who spend a lot of money on going to college in the United States and who um, care about American cultural values and you know want to forge a path here. So we're mm -hmm. supporting international students to connect with employers that um, value diversity and one of the ways that they want to demonstrate that is by being open to immigration sponsorship for people as well. Um, and so I see this in the technology world a lot. I also, you know, notice uh, a, a gender difference that often plays out what, because I get extraordinary ability, you know, genius visas for people. Mm -hmm. And so um, it can happen along a lot of factors or spectrums, but you know, people come with their resume to me and say, hey, can I get this? And there's some people who are very confident and say, oh, yeah, get this for me, Sophie. I, I should do. I should be able to have it. I'm like, I'm sorry. You meet maybe one, maybe two of the criteria. You need at least three. And mm -hmm. then other groups of people say, oh, I don't know. Maybe you should take a look, Sophie, and let me know. Uh, I'm like, hey, you meet six. You just needed three. We could apply now. You could have already had a green card. America needs you. Like, no, I still have to do more research. It's not perfect yet. There's more papers coming. I have to try harder. Um, so I just, I love that job ads are becoming more inclusive and about what you will bring to the role and as opposed to where you've been in the past. Sounds like you're bridging that confidence gap quite a bit. I mean, which, which is amazing. And in, in, imposter syndrome is a, is a huge thing go. that many people, mm -hmm. including myself, have contended with, so that yeah well that's a move in the right direction if you can you know at least encourage and show them like real written proof that you actually do qualify perhaps over qualify in many yeah. ways i i think yeah. that's a step in the right direction yeah. um and then uh, just kind of strictly back to Rhonda, i was just wondering how you seen that translate into um, your position as starting makeup america and I know you've kind of taken the inclusive spirit into creating makeup that speaks to the vast um, cultures and, and backgrounds that we have mm -hmm. here in the States and like making sure no one feels left out. Right. It, yeah, no, exactly. That's what it's about. Again, very much like the definition of America. What's the definition of beauty? Right. right. For everybody, it's different. And it's not like, you know, that blonde hair, blue eyed, white skin girl that everybody thought was the beautiful American, right? Um, we're changing. And I wanted to do something that not only reflects that, but also makes everybody feel welcome. So I like to say, you know, I developed these this makeup line made in America, um, mm -hmm. honoring some of our great um, sort of icons in America, and, you know, priced patriotically after some historic events in our country. But I'm not the same color I am in, what are we, March now, that I am in July. Yeah. And, and it's mostly that way for most Americans. You're just not the same skin tone color 12 mm -hmm. months out of the year. And in America, we are a mix of different skin tones and skin colors because we're a mixture of cultures. And because of that, you know, there's not necessarily one particular beauty brand that can reflect all of that. And what I've said is, look, you know, we're continuing to grow. It's a startup. But I do believe that we will become America's beauty brand. Because right now, there's not a lot of beauty brands that are made in America, aside mm -hmm. from that, that yeah. are America's beauty brand. Like, you know, you can start to think of all the different companies that you think of as American, right? 
you know, kind of Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Ford Motor Company, right? American Girl Doll, Bank of America, American Airlines. Mm -hmm. And you always think of those companies as American companies, but like a lot of folks said today, you really have to start hiring and bringing on diversity and models that look like America and mm -hmm. reaching out to everybody so that they can be part of that American dream through a reflection of, of cosmetics, which the biggest, you know, consumers of cosmetics in the world right here in America. Right. I mean, and what do you, what impact do you think that the immigrant experience has on the American dream and how that right. translates into beauty as well? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm the child of immigrants, so I'm a little biased here and I can only talk to you about my experience. I don't ever say that I can, you know, talk about anybody else's experience, but I do feel that I had an extra special appreciation for the American dream. My parents were so fortunate to be here. They loved America. They came here as graduate students. They loved it. They stayed. And because mm -hmm. of that, everything was magnified for them, whether it was a swearing in ceremony to becoming an American citizen or a political convention or Disney World or NASA and the space rocket or the resignation of Richard Nixon or the Brady Bunch or the Partridge family or McDonald's. I mean, everything was super, super magnified because it was new to them mm -hmm. and it was America. So I remember when, you know, the space rocket was launched and we went to the moon, my dad sat us down and said, look at this, like, this is America. This is what we could do. Um, and, and I can only talk about my experience, but I translated that into my beauty brand by mm -hmm. saying, I make up America, you make up America, we all make up America. I, it sounds like your parents planted that we by saying, look at what we can do and already saying, here we are, we're part of the American dream already. So. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, again, don't get me wrong. There wasn't like there wasn't any trouble when my parents came here in the 50s or rejection in the turmoil of the 60s, right? Or of the 70s. I mean, yeah. everybody went through that. My parents went through that. But there was enough of that American dream and that hope, I think Tom Friedman, the famous New York Times columnist and author, called it with immigrants, it's called a paranoid optimism, right? Because <laughs> you're always paranoid about, are you doing the right thing? But you're crazy optimistic about yeah. what America could do for you. Absolutely. Um, I like that. I'm going to have to make sure I use that phrase. Yeah. Tom Friedman. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it beats cautious optimism, I think. <laughs> optimism. <laughs> um, and Sanjeet, just getting back into academia, um, do you feel that there's been a bit of a sea change in the way that uh, courses are being developed and taught at the university level? Um, and if so, what kinds of lasting impacts do you think that the year that was 2020 and, and currently still feels like we're rolling on um, with the residuals of it, how do you think that might continue to shape the way that we educate uh, people about um, not only current events, but our past? Well, you know, I mean, I think one thing that's clear is that, um, you know, over the past about 12 and 13 months, and probably like many of you, I'm probably getting sick and tired of the kind of anniversary emails that we see kind of our announcements rolling through our inboxes um, or sending them ourselves. And I, um, but I will say that um, uh, that probably two of the industries that will probably see the, some of the greatest shifts and transformations um, post pandemic are healthcare and higher education, um, and and they should. Uh, they're both long overdue for more systematic change and reevaluation. Uh, and I say this um, as someone that uh, likes what I do, and uh, at the same time knows that there's a tremendous opportunity here. And specifically, when we layer the pandemic that we've seen regarding COVID-19 uh, over the pandemic that we've seen of institutional racism and institutional white supremacy that has unfortunately kind of colored a lot of our institutions, including healthcare and higher education. Um, so the goal here is to realize that as we think about the tragedy that occurred in Atlanta this week and we think about George Floyd, I'm living in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and so Obviously, the kind of trial going on is of heightened. We have uh, such a heightened awareness of that. Um, 
the two are not uh, the two are not uh, uh, distinct from each other, and since they are they are related, um, these fractures are related. So the question is, how do you teach through this change? Uh, there's an opportunity here to go ahead and understand that uh, diversity and equity is an ancillary to excellence. It is excellence. Um, uh, you know, looking at cultural plurality or multiculturalism um, is not a is not a, a value proposition that's based upon uh, what seems nice. It's not about compliance. Uh, it's about going ahead and educating the future leaders, regardless of the color of their skin or their ethnic background. So I do think that there's a real uh, incredible opportunity, and quite a few of my colleagues in higher ed are also seizing on that right now. That's that's wonderful to hear because it's like uh, the seeds that are sown now are going to have such incredible impact going forward for future leaders. Um and also just coming back to you, Sid, um, from your unique perspective, you know, heading up your organization for so long, I'm sure that, you know, you have a context of a little bit longer of a period that you've been able to um, have that kind of bird's eye view and also be in the trenches as well of how uh, America is doing in, in terms of giving opportunities, um, presenting opportunities to uh, people of Hispanic descent, whatever part of the diaspora that may be in the U.S. and whatever that um, overcoming some of these barriers and prejudices. And I'm sure, as you mentioned earlier, wanting to show solidarity across the board with underrepresented people in this country as well. Well, um, I, I, I think that... Um a little bit of building, even I think of what Abby mentioned um, earlier, as well as uh, uh, what Sanchi mentioned, is is, is that the it, it's it's not just the uh, you know the opportunity; it's the it, it is the access, mm -hmm. and, and and what's what's happened is that um, and, and you know I I I speak to. Not only companies, but a lot of uh, you know, but the community in general, um, about the fact that there is a different, um, there's a different playbook, or there's a different um, strategy of of diversity and, and, and inclusion and and, and cultural uh, uh, equity. Um, once you start getting into the higher areas of leadership, uh, mm -hmm. for example. Um, where you know companies are trained to say, well, let's hire more people of color, let's hire more women, let's hire more LGBTQ plus, and then that'll address the diversity problem. But then they have another problem. It's called retention, and uh, and then they're in this forever cycle of trying to consistently trying to replenish uh, their diversity hires because their current diversity uh, employees are leaving. And it's because they uh, have not addressed a major problem that's throughout corporate America, and that is, is that um, is that people of color uh, have, for many many decades, been asked to assimilate to a white centric corporate culture, mm -hmm. uh, and when and some people will assimilate. You know, where they are no longer being their true authentic self, but they were being their non-authentic self for the purposes of that job or that promotion or that senior leadership role. Right. Um, for those of us that are very authentic to ourselves, mm -hmm. um, either A, you may move up the corporate ladder, but then you start um, feeling less uh, like this is what you really wanted to do. And then eventually your conscience kicks in and says, I'm out of here, even if I am a senior executive or, or, or a senior vice president. And, and then when you look at the exit interviews and say, well, why'd you leave? You're the senior vice president. Mm -hmm. um, you find that the common denominator uh, is the fact that there was a lack of inclusion. And so, so one of the things that I share with companies um, that that how and how they can be a solution to bridging that cultural divide is to stop looking at this from a male centric view when trying to figure out how to get more women into senior leadership roles. Mm -hmm. Stop asking for people of color, blacks, Latinos, Asian Americans uh, to start um, uh, behaving like we're white 
in order to be accepted into a very white centric uh, 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 club. And and for those companies that I think have moved the needle, but still have some have some issues, I tell them, stop treating us like we are guests. Guests mean that you're invited to the C-suite, you're invited to the, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the board meeting, you're invited to um, that dinner, but when, the come, when it comes time to actual membership into this club society, that um, that is that's that's where or what sometimes we call the executive session in a board meeting, for example. As you know, when you're in executive session, what do you, what's the first thing you do? You kick everybody out, <laughs> and you say everybody out except for those who really really belong. Right. And and that's that's always to me the ultimate test is that when it's time for executive session, do you stay or are you ask to leave? Hmm. And that is when you will find out, are you truly being included? And if they tell you that, I'm sorry, this is executive session there, that's when you get to the core that's, fundamental. That's the barrier. That's the delineation that's there. there. Yeah. And, 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 exactly. Well, it, and it's interesting what you were talking about just a little earlier in was just about that code switching idea, right? Where you have to sort of uh, suppress your, your natural, your authentic self in order to fit into the norm, the societal norm and the corporate norm sometimes. Um, and I think you're right that if you're having to self suppress for so long, then that can lead to a special kind of cultural burnout, really. Um, so that's interesting that you been privy to those kinds of, you know, those exit re exit interviews that are, okay, here's my chance to finally <laughs> tell what's been holding me back. And unfortunately, it's on the way out the door. So I think um, the, the next steps would be making sure people do feel free enough to express themselves and, and we can avoid that sort of um, exclusion. That's, that's so, so much the norm, but hopefully is something we're, we've all been chipping away at this wall, you know, and bridging this divide. We do just have a few minutes left in our session. So um, I would like to invite each of you if, you, if you would like to have anything else you would like to add before I just kind of give our closing remarks. Love to hear from you. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to start. Um, yeah. From my 30 years of experience in Washington with government policymakers, uh, bridging the cultural divide isn't going to happen through government, right? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, my social purpose of my company is paying down the U.S. national debt. We are at trillions now, okay? I started, it was 18, we're in the 20s now. The U.S. government isn't going to tackle our debt. So I decided to create a company $1 at a time for a lipstick that's going to pay down the debt. The private sector in America, the entrepreneurs in America, all of you, who are my colleagues today in America, you're going to bridge the cultural divide. The government's not. I love the government. It could do great things, but it's not going to do that. It's going to be the private sector. It's going to be the ingenuity of the private mm -hmm. sector that does that. You make a very good point there. Rhonda. Um, I think it's got to come not only from the private sector. I think it's got to come somewhere from government. I see some glimmers of hope. <laughs> from government, of course, you have the experience that it is a slow moving machine, yeah. but hopefully there's a glimmer of hope. And then, you know, through, through law, through um, a, a little bit more of a focus on inclusiveness and immigration law and through these uh, corporate partnerships and organizations and, and through our higher education, hopefully we'll be able to, um, to try to break down these barriers and, look back at 2020 as a year that was uh, dark at times, but led to a breakthrough. Um, and maybe was that tipping point and something that we can um, kind of have a before and after in a positive way for so many of us. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to all of my incredibly insightful panelists. And um, also just wanted to thank Parasis for giving us this platform um, and forum to discuss all of these issues. Um, we have a couple people that are in the chat room. Um, if you would like to connect with any of our esteemed panelists, 
please feel free to message me or uh, my email is in my profile as well. Feel free to shoot me an email or connect with them directly. Um, again, thank you to everybody who has been on this panel. Um, I think that we've all kind of had the opportunity to learn from each other from coming from such different perspectives, but reaching um, such a powerful consensus at the same time. So thanks everyone. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you everybody everyone. for your insights. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. <laughs>